Okay, yeah. Hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the second talk of the 2024 invited seminar series organized by IEEE Computer Society San Diego chapter. Uh, and uh, we are delighted to host uh, Manasa uh, as our guest speaker today. Uh, the talk is co-hosted by IEEE Computer Society chapters of Dallas, Foothill, San Antonio, Pikes Peak, Utah, Boise, Wichita, Hawaii, and Albuquerque sections. Uh, as always, we have Open Research Institute in Corporation as our media partner for the entire series. And most of our talks are recorded and uploaded to a YouTube channel maintained by ORI for later viewing. So uh, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker. So Malasa Kalandha Vatta is a PhD candidate in computer science at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Her research interests span the domains of ubiquitous sensing, machine learning, and human computer interaction with a focus on applications in health and well being. Manasa's work revolves around innovative, biologically grounded assessment tools that facilitate convenient and scalable screening for behavioral disorders using mobile and wearable devices. Uh, Manasa did research internships at Meta Reality Labs on large scale machine learning for neuromotor interfaces and at Nokia Bell Labs, exploring multimodal, multi device sensing of mental fatigue using wearables. Her contributions have been recognized through publications in uh, prestigious computer science and interdisciplinary venues, including uh, IMWT, uh, JMIR, and Pervasive Health. Uh, also, uh, her research has garnered attention from the NFS iCorp Innovators Jumpstart Research Commercialization Program at UMass Amherst, and she was honored with a Technology Development Grant from the UMass President's Office. In addition to her academic achievements, Manasa received the 2023 UBICOM uh, Outstanding Student Award and a dissertation award from the Center of Research on Families at UMass Amherst. She also participated at a CRAWP grad cohort for human, women scholar, further highlighting her commitment to advancing diversity and inclusion in computing. We are delighted to have Manasa share her expertise and insight with us today. So without further ado, Manasa, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Dr. Mahbub, for the very kind introduction um, and for having me here. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, present to you today, and I'm going to talk about uh, neurophysiology aware mental health screening using mobile and wearable devices. Uh, so uh, let's start by discussing the ongoing mental health crisis in the U.S. and around the world. Um, so over 22 percent of U.S. adults, as you might know, experience mental illness every year. But perhaps more surprisingly, so do over 16% of children aged 6 to 17. Um, so while these are the official numbers, uh, actual prevalence rates are likely even higher because mental and behavioral symptoms routinely go undiagnosed, misdiagnosed, or are diagnosed very late after onset. Uh, so today I'll talk a little bit about this assessment gap in mental health care. Um, it stems from various reasons, including limited access to services, the fact that symptom presentation varies widely across individuals, and that clinicians often lack the data to accurately diagnose conditions, as well as mental health illiteracy and social stigma. Uh, we've recently seen researchers make the case for mobile and wearable devices as a means to address this diagnostic gap. So these devices can be used to deliver convenient and accessible assessments in the home. Uh, they can provide additional data for diagnosis and enable pathways for individuals to seek further mental health care. So my research particularly focuses on enabling such mental health screening tools, but instead of focusing on just detecting behavioral symptoms, I also aim to understand the neurophysiological underpinnings of mental disorders. I further work on making these uh, screening tools as scalable and um, usable as an instant read thermometer. So to that end, my work explores two broad themes. First, I work toward developing, evaluating, and 
deploying scalable at home assessments for health and well being outcomes using commercial devices. Uh, second, I work on multimodal assessments that effectively combine behavioral and neurophysiological signals. Uh, so my work takes an end to end mixed methods approach. Uh, I think about the sensing paradigms to use from passive sensing of an individual's daily life behavior uh, to assessments where the individual is actively engaged in a specific well validated task. Uh, I design assessments ranging from questionnaires and behavioral tasks to gamified tests. I use a range of sensing modalities on smartphones, tablets, and wearable devices, from uh, visual and audio data to physiological signals and movement information, and conduct human subject studies to collect data. Then I use statistical and machine learning methods to derive insights from multimodal data about mental health outcomes. And lastly, I engage with stakeholders to evaluate the utility and usability of screening tools um, and as need finding for future tools. I'll describe some of these components of my research in more detail throughout the talk. Uh, I will also primarily focus today on my work on mental health sensing for young children, uh, cutting across both of these research themes. Uh, so why focus on early childhood mental health? Uh, the mental health issues are a widespread concern in children with one in six two to eight year olds living with mental, emotional or behavioral disorders in the United States. It is also especially difficult to recognize signs of problematic behavior, especially at the preschool age, uh, where many parents do not know when to be concerned about their child's behavior. And even primary care providers were often the first line of clinical support are only able to uh, accurately identify about 30% of clinical patients during routine pediatric visits. The state-of-the-art method to identify early childhood psychopathology are um, basically behavioral screening instruments, which are validated measures that can identify up to 70% of clinical patients. However, these require extensive interviews with parents that are time-consuming and need to be administered by a trained professional. Also, they don't consider the neurophysiological underpinnings of the mental disorder, instead focusing just on the behavioral symptoms. Um, so to illustrate what I mean by this, let's look at the underlying neurophysiology of emotion dysregulation. So emotion dysregulation is the inability to properly modulate the duration, balance, or intensity of an emotional experience. Why is it important? Because it is a characteristic feature of some of the most common chi early childhood behavioral disorders like ADHD. Uh, there has been a lot of research into the neural and physiological underpinnings of emotion regulation. So people have looked into um, children's brain activity during frustration and found that higher activity in the lateral prefrontal cortex is associated with higher frustration tolerance and lower irritability. Similarly, they've also found that conduct problems in children are associated with a lower galvanic skin response activity and a lower heart rate during emotional tasks. So being able to measure these neural and physiological signals during frustration could provide clinicians with an objective marker of emotion dysregulation in children. However, measuring neural activity is really challenging. So here you can see a child lying absolutely still with an EEG cap with numerous wires sticking out and inhibiting their movement. So this kind of setup is extremely difficult to use, especially with younger children and is nearly impossible outside clinical settings. So we asked, can we estimate neural activity using behavioral data? This requires answering a range of different questions like what are the behaviors that should give us a good estimate and under what settings, and how do we measure and model these signals? Uh, this was what I explored in my work on early screen, which is a screening tool to detect emotion dysregulation related psychopathology, as well as lateral prefrontal cortex brain activity in the wild. So early screen uses a gamified task that induces frustration to observe children's um, emotion regulation response. 
It measures validated behavioral correlates of emotion regulation, including facial muscle movements and eye and head movements. Uh, these behaviors can be observed via video, which is great because uh, it allows us to leverage on device cameras on smartphones and tablets and use computer vision algorithms to model them. So most importantly, early screen is a rapid and accessible assessment that can be quote unquote played on a tablet at home uh, by children in less than 10 minutes. Uh, to develop early screen, we ra ran an in-lab study with 94 participants who were aged three and a half to five years. Uh, these children played a frustration-inducing game where they were asked to select the most delicious cake for customers at a virtual bakery. Uh, the customers then gave them positive or negative feedback on their choices. What the children don't know is that the feedback is predetermined and repeated negative feedback is meant to induce frustration in the child. Uh, so at the same time, the pa child's parent completed four well-validated behavioral questionnaires uh, that are used by clinicians, which included the CBCL externalizing disorder subscale, the MAP-DB temper loss scale, and the ADHD inattention and hyperactivity subscales. In the early screen study, within the lab setting, we recorded neural activation in the lateral prefrontal cortex using functional near infrared spectroscopy. So this uses a cap with optodes that shine near infrared light onto the scalp and then read the reflected light to estimate blood, oxygen, blood oxygenation levels and measure brain activity. We also record facial expressions, eye gaze and head movements via RGB video. When translating early screen to the home setting, children will play the frustration inducing game on a tablet and only the behavioral features will be recorded via front facing cameras. Uh, to give you a quick outline of how early screen predicts child psychopathology, it uses um, video frames following the positive or negative feedback provided by the virtual customers in the game. And then we use the open face facial analysis library to ex extract children's reaction to feedback, computing behavioral features like the presence and intensity of validated facial action units, the uh, presence of um, positive or negative affect, and the change in gaze angle and head position. These are then used to predict two different indicators of psychopathology. The first is low activation in the lateral prefrontal cortex during frustration, which we have already seen as associated with poor emotion regulation. We calculate the magnitude of change in the oxyhemoglobin in the lateral pre prefrontal cortex during frustration, which is denoted by this beta value you see in the chart. The second indicator is clinical risk or whether the child scores above the clinical threshold on at least one of the parent completed questionnaires. Uh, the main challenge in trying to predict these indicators is that there is a single label for individual corresponding to low or normal prefrontal cortex activation and above or below clinical threshold. Hi, so Anasa, sort of, may yeah. I ask one question? Sure. In the questionnaire, what were, what type of questions were those? Um, the questionnaires are just behavioral questionnaires where parents report how many times the child might have had a tantrum in the past one week. Um, how many times the child might have reacted a certain way to things not going their way. Those kind of things. And that's a standard set of questions. Or did you develop also the no. questionnaire? Um, these are standard clinical questionnaires standard. that are used by uh, therapists to diagnose ah, children. I see. Okay. okay. Yeah. Please continue. Yeah. Um, so the main challenge in trying to predict these indicators of psychopathology, both the uh, neural activity and the above and below clinical threshold on questionnaires, is that we have a fairly limited number of samples to train supervised learning models. However, at the same time, we have multiple trials per individual corresponding to each time the child selects a cake and receives feedback. Uh, so this gives us an opportunity to learn from fine grained data uh, at the trial level, in addition to the overall task level data. So this setting is somewhat similar to the multiple instance learning framework in machine learning. So in multiple instance learning problems, 
Each sample is represented by a bag uh, BI containing many instances XI1 through XIN. Uh, these may or may not have their own instance level labels, but there is a bag level label YI. As an example, if you think of an image, it can be considered a set of many smaller patches. If we want to determine whether the image contains a face, we can check each patch, and if one of them contains a face, we can claim that the image contains a face. This is the standard MIL assumption. We assume that each instance has a positive or negative label, and any bag with at least one positive instance label is assigned a positive label at the bag level. So, how does this translate to early screen? We can think of each individual as a bag, and then each positive or negative feedback trial as an instance in that bag. So the bag level labels of clinical or non-clinical and low or no normal activation apply to each child. But this breaks the standard MIL assumption in that there are no instance level labels. This means that we need a different way to model the bag level labels independently. Uh, the framework I propose here uses a multiple instance learning pipeline which contains a bag representation module. This module learns a transformation from the instance level feature space to a bag level feature space. This function f can be as simple as the mean of all the instance level features, but in practice we use slightly more complicated transformations. So once we have the bag level features, we can use those as input to a supervised learning module to directly predict the bag level labels. Um, I propose to combine this with what we call a single instance pipeline, which aggregates all data from an individual to extract task level features. So to summarize, our multiple instance fusion framework works something like this. We have a sequence of video frames, uh, and from this we extract a bag containing feedback instances following each trial. Uh, we have a feature extraction module that uh, extracts instance level features from each of these trials and a bag representation module that converts them to bag level features. These are fed to a supervised learning module to output class probabilities. This whole pipeline is called the multiple instance learning pipeline. At the same time, we have the frames following all feedback segments which are input to a feature extraction module to get aggregate features from all feedback segments at the task level. This independently is used to also predict class probabilities using a supervised learning module. This pipeline is called the single instance learning pipeline. We use a weighted fusion to predict the final class label at the individual level. Uh, without getting into the weeds of the bag representation functions and the supervised learning algorithms that we tested, I'll just leave you with the prediction results averaged over five-fold cross-validation. So our models were able to detect low neural activation with an area under the ROC curve of 0.85 using facial action units as features. Um, so this is on par with the accuracy of current screening instruments, such as the CBCL, which only predict behavioral symptoms. Uh, the fact that we're able to predict neural information with this level of accuracy using only 10 minutes of data is highly encouraging because it gives clinicians access to a completely new data source to make diagnosis. Similarly, we were also able to predict clinical risk status uh, based on the questionnaires with an AUROC of 0.8. This model uses facial action units, expressions, and eye and head movements as features. The model's performance is again on par with other technology-based screening tools for clinical symptom prediction. Overall, early screen shows the feasibility of predicting both behavioral symptoms and the underlying neural information in a quick, convenient, and scalable manner. I'll refer you to the paper for more details about the algorithm and the performance of these models across demographic groups. Uh, but we will talk a little bit more about clinicians and parents' perspectives towards the utility of such tools further in the talk. Um, so now that we've talked about the feasibility of an at-home uh, screening tool predicting neural information, I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about a complementary thread of research on predicting child psychopathology using multimodal signals. So we've talked about how measuring neural activity is challenging but what can we do if we could measure it? 
This could be possible from time to time in clinical settings, for example, in addition to more regular home based screening. So, specifically, can we better predict mental health outcomes if we have access to neural and physiological data? For this, we need to consider how we would interpret and use these neural signals and how we would integrate them with uh, behavioral data. To answer these questions, we used the in lab early screen setup where children played the frustration inducing game on a touch screen computer. Along with the facial action units that were recorded via video, we collected the FNES based neural activation data as well as the galvanic skin response signals from the child's arm. We first look at predicting clinical risk using each of these individual modalities. At a high level, the pipeline for this looks something like this. We have the observed signals that are used to extract some clinically validated features, which are then fed to a supervised learning module, which then predicts the clinical or non-clinical label. In our scenario, we have observed signals from GSR, video, and FNEOS. We extract trial level features from these signals along with a feature indicating whether it was a positive or negative feedback trial. The GSR data is used to extract the maximum phasic amplitude, the skin conductance response amplitude, the rise time, and the recovery time of these signals. Uh, from videos, we get the presence and absence of 18 different facial action units. And from the FNIA signal, we get the uh, beta values or the magnitude of change in oxy and deoxyhemoglobin values separately for the left and right prefrontal cortex. Um, abstracting out some of these details about um, the supervised learning module, these features are input into a trial level classifier to get the clinical or non-clinical label. So, if you look at the prediction performance of each modality, we see that all of them predict clinical status with AUROCs above the chance level. The GSR model performs best with an AUROC of 0.78. However, there is a problem with extracting features in this way. So, if we look at the number of trials where we could actually get these handcrafted features for each modality, we see a large discrepancy. This is because the way some of these uh, clinically validated features are calculated, they sometimes require large time windows to calculate. This is not very data efficient because not being able to compute features from a particular trial means underutilization of the available data. So keeping this issue aside for now, let's also look at multimodal prediction where we combine GSR video and FNES data to see if we can improve prediction accuracy. So to do this, first we simply concatenate all features from all modalities and input them to a classifier. This gives us an AUROC of 0.62, which is actually lower than that of any individual signal. This is clearly not an efficient use of multimodality. If we look back to the number of trials where we were able to extract handcrafted features, Concatenation makes the problem worse because the intersection of all these valid, valid trials is an even smaller number. Again, missing features leads to unutilized data. So we ask, can we extract features from multimodal signals in a more data efficient manner while also leveraging complementary information across different modalities? To do this, I propose a two-stage multitask supervised contrastive learning approach. In the first stage, we train a neural network to extract multimodal features by minimizing the multitask supervised contrastive loss. This is done by extracting the outputs of the final layer or the projection layer for each input trial. The supervised contrastive loss minimizes the distance between projections of similar trials. In this case, um, L main. Uh, this is all the trials from clinical individuals versus those from non-clinical individuals. And uh, similarly, the auxiliary loss L aux minimizes the distance between projections of positive feedback trials while separating them from the projections of negative feedback trials. In stage two, this embedding module is frozen and used to extract trial level features, which are then used to um, predict labels using a supervised classifier. 
Uh, the architecture of the neural network that we used as the embedding model is shown here. So we use a modality specific input head with a late fusion approach to combine them, ultimately extracting uh, an embedding of length eight. So to evaluate this multitask contrastive approach, let's look back to the performance of the classifier using handcrafted features, which achieved an AURC of 0.62. With the multimodal embedding features, we are able to achieve an AURC of 0.9, which is a 28% improvement. And if we look at data, data utilization, we're also able to increase the number of usable trials more than twice over. This shows that we're able to eff uh, effectively extract multimodal, uh, multimodal features that leverage complementary information across different modalities for more accurate psychopathology screening. Um, now that we've looked at the feasibility of scalable um, neurophysiology aware tools and ways to improve the accuracy of in lab multimodal assessments, uh, I want to draw your attention to the question of usability. So, deploying screening tools in the real world requires that they provide value to users in a way that they want them to. Um, if we look at screening tools for young children in particular, there are some additional considerations to be made. So children depend on multiple stakeholders, including parents and family, school teachers and healthcare professionals to identify issues and to coordinate care for them. So we ask, what are the unmet needs of some of these stakeholders, especially parents um, and clinicians as they care for children today? And to what extent can these gaps be addressed by home-based screening technologies? To investigate this, I conducted two studies in the context of early screen. In our first study, we surveyed 60 mental health practitioners from the American um, Psychological Association's Society for Clinical Child and Adolescent Psychology. We asked them questions about the current diagnostic practices, the perceived utility of apps like early screen, and any concerns they may ha have about deploying and using such apps. We also interviewed 25 parents of children between the ages of three to five who may or may not have concerns about their child's behavior. We asked them about their general parenting concerns and how they seek help, as well as the utility that they see in home-based screening tools. So let's talk about some, some of the themes derived from these survey and interview data. In terms of concerns and gaps, parents reported a lack of scaffolding for identifying behavioral concerns. They compared this to children's physical development where scaffolding tools like growth charts made it easier to identify issues, noting how such instruments were missing for behavioral and social emotional development. Clinicians also felt that there were limited resources for tracking development, especially instruments that were free and could be used repeatedly. They also reported how important data was often missing when they were making um, diagnostic uh, decisions, including information from both parents and the child's school, as well as, as well as contextual data from the child's home. When asked about the perceived benefits of screening tools, stakeholders felt that app-based tools could provide um, increased access and augment the existing data that is available for screening. Parents and clinicians felt that gamified tools would also make uh, screening more frictionless for children, especially those who would not open up to a clinician outside the house. These tools could also support parents in navigating both their parenting experience and their own stress related to their child's health. So talking about the roadblocks to the widespread deployment of screening tools, the biggest concern was the integration of these tools within existing clinical services, including barriers related to insurance and training costs. Stakeholders also spoke about the need to build trust in these emerging screening tools and to minimize the potential for harm in terms of data privacy, algorithmic biases, et cetera. So we distilled our findings further to identify the design tensions associated with building new screening tools for young children and to formulate recommendations to resolve these tensions. We, no we noted three major tensions, which I will describe one by one, along with a few design recommendations to deal with them. So first, clinicians and parents want tools uh, that 
observe a child's behavior longitudinally and in response to fixed stimuli, both to collect deeper insights and to build trust. However, administering such tools may cause additional burdens for families. Um, so we recommend that uh, new screening tools use screen-free assessment mediums to uh, decrease the amount of screen time that children are uh, exposed to. We also recommend giving parents control over the stimuli that the children are exposed to. For example, in early screen, we could have the parent um, determine the number of positive and negative feedback trials that the child will see. Um, second, we saw that while gamified at-home screening tools can be beneficial for children who do not want to visit doctors or engage with traditional screening methods, solely relying on such tools can also be detrimental to their own health. So we recommend that uh, designers focus on building engaging experiences that children will actually want to engage with for a longitudinal period, uh, but also provide next steps for parents in following up the, uh, with the diagnosis that they receive from these apps. The third tension we observed uh, was scaling beyond the clinic versus minimizing contamination and harm. So digital tools have the potential to highly scale mental health screening but observation and inference outside sterile clinical settings can also lead to data contamination and raise privacy concerns. So we recommend that screening tools account for context and measure this variability in context while making inferences and also protect the data and outcomes, um, both the data that they collect um, as well as the outcomes that they produce so that uh, there is no social stigma associated with them or there is no um, uh, red shirting of children who are identified as, as being at risk. Um, so now that we've talked about some recommendations, let's briefly talk about how to incorporate these in the design of new screening tools. I'll illustrate this with an example of my ongoing work uh, on at-home play-based behavioral screening. Uh, the main goals for this work were to model child behavior and psychopathology like we saw before, but to do this in a screen-free medium that is natural and engaging to children. We also want to explicitly involve the parent and be able to provide them with actionable next steps. Uh, to this end, we chose parent-child interactions as an assessment medium. I model these interactions based on special time play sessions that are routinely used as part of parent-child interaction therapy. So these play sessions take place in clinical settings and consist of 10 minutes of child-led play where the child makes the rules for them to play with the parent, followed by 10 minutes of parent-led play where the parent dictates the rules of the games, followed by five minutes of cleanup where the parent asks the child to clean up without any help. Um, so as you see, as the session progresses, the parent asserts a little more control over the child. In parent-child interaction therapy, the therapist observes these sessions in the clinic and often manually codes the behavior they observe using the dyadic parent-child interaction coding system. So they note down instances of positive talk, negative talk, commands, questions, labeled phrase, etc that the parents are using with their child. To translate this to a home-based setting, I use a smartphone app that guides parents through these sessions at home via audio prompts. And we collect parent and child speech and parent and child heart rate, GSR and movement, as well as parent reported behavior and psychopathology using the app, a wearable, um, uh, wearable device, and parent reported questionnaires. Uh, to give you a quick overview of the objectives of the study, we plan to use the audio and physiological signals from the parent and the child to train multimodal models predicting clinical outcomes. We then plan to also train an audio only model via transfer learning or by using a shared representation space to make inferences without access to variable data. This would make the system more scalable and accessible in the wild. Lastly, we plan to model parent-child interaction behaviors such that we are able to provide actionable feedback for the parents about which behaviors might be more beneficial to their child through causal modeling and counterfactual explanations. 
So now that we've discussed some of these applications of child mental health screening research, I wanted to highlight two pieces of impact that this work has had. Uh, first, this research was recognized by the UBICOM Gaetano Borriello Outstanding Student Award in 2023, which is the most distinguished student award in the ubiquitous computing community. community. Uh, the potential for commercialization of this work was also recognized by a technology development award from the UMass President's Office and by its selection for the NSF ICORS um, Innovative Jumpstart Program for Text Transfer. Um, there are also opportunities for neurophysiology aware screening tools beyond child mental health. So, for example, some of my past research has looked into domains such as cognitive performance, mental fatigue, and post traumatic stress. I'll briefly highlight our work on PTSD as an example. So, as many of you might know, PTSD is a serious psychiatric condition that develops after exposure to trauma. It is characterized by recurring intrusive thoughts, flashbacks, and avoidance of trauma-related stimuli. However, while it is generally associated with military populations, what a lot of people don't know is that the lifetime prevalence among civilians in the U.S. is between 3 and 27 percent, with females being at higher risk for PTSD. Research has shown that PTSD is associated with behavioral markers like significant negative affect and deficits in memory, as well as uh, neurophysiological um, symptoms like a stronger amygdala response to emotional stimuli, as well as physiological signals like higher heart rate and lower heart rate variability during stress. Given these characteristics, we ask, can we, uh, can we use task performance or physiological and neural signals during these tasks uh, to identify post-traumatic stress? Uh, so the questions to answer here are which cognitive tasks would be the best predictors of PTSD and which neurophysiological signals would contribute most to predictions. To answer these questions, we conducted a study with 31 civilian participants, all female nursing students. Um, these participants filled the PTSD checklist civilian versions and we identified that 19 of them actually scored above the clinical threshold for PTSD. Uh, they also reported affect measures, such as positive and negative affect, somatic arousal, and their perceived stress scores. Uh, then they completed a set of cognitive tasks, ranging from att attentional control tasks, which included the reaction time task and the go-no-go -no -go task, emotion regulation tasks like the emotional stroop and emotional working memory, and working memory tasks like the NBAC and audio NBAC tasks. We also recorded neural and physiological measures, including FNIRS-based beta values indicating neural activity in three different regions of interest in the prefrontal cortex. We simultaneously recorded physiological signals via biopack, so we used ECG to measure their mean heart rate and mean ECG peak distance. We measured their respiration rate as well as the electrodermal activity, including the amplitude and the rise time of the EDA signal. Um, so let's first look into detecting the presence of PTSD based on an individual's performance on a cognitive task alone. I won't go into the details of our machine learning approaches today, but if we look at the prediction performance based on um, just the accuracy and response times on each cognitive task, we see that we're able to predict P uh, PTSD with F1 scores above 0.76. The NBAC task, um, which is a working memory task, uh, is the best at predicting PTSD. What is interesting is that the combination of all of these tasks does not actually improve prediction F1 scores. Let's look at multimodal prediction of PTSD now. So compared to task performance alone, Adding biopack features resulted in higher prediction F1 scores on the go no go emotional stroop, emotional working memory, and audio and back tasks. Adding FNIRS features also resulted in a higher prediction performance on five of these tasks. Adding both biopack and FNIRS feature in, features in addition to task performance results in a higher prediction F1 on the uh, reaction time and the audio and back tasks. 
Um, so what are the implications of these results? Uh, so we see that if we want to do PTSD classification, and we want to do this in the wild with no additional sensing capabilities and just task performance, then it is best to use the NBAC task um, as a predictive task, and we can achieve an F1 score of 0.8. Uh, if we have access to physiological sensing via variables, we could use the audio and back task and use the task performance plus physiological signals to achieve an F1 score of around 0.88. If we have access to both physiological sensing as well as portable or in-lab FNIRs, the audio and back task is the best predictor achieving an F1 score of 0.91. This shows that having access to neurophysiology data can indeed improve the accuracy of mental health assessments. Another important concern with machine learning based mental health screening is the interpretability of models. So in this work, we looked into how we can interpret feature importances and contextualize them within existing research in the clinical domain. So we look at the SHAP summary plot, which is um, a, a plot of the feature magnitudes of each feature versus the SHAP value. The SHAP value is a gain theoretic feature importance score uh, for each feature in the model's predictions. A higher positive SHAP value implies a higher predicted PTSD probability from the model. So this is the SHAP summary plot. So what do we see from this? We observe that um, a higher PTSD uh, probability is associated with a higher activation in the right FPA and the left PMC, and a lower activation in the right DLPFC, the left OFC, and the right PMC. Uh, looking at physiological features, a higher predicted PTSD probability is also associated with a greater EEG, ECG peak distance, respiration rate, and an EDA rise time, and a lower heart rate and EDA amplitude. So if we compare these findings with prior literature, we see that prior work also indicates a lower activation in the right hemisphere during working memory tasks as being associated with a higher PTSD probability. However, the association with physiological signals during working memory tasks is unknown. So these evaluations allow us to identify potential biomarkers for mental disorders that can be further validated by future work using these cognitive tasks. So now that we've talked about neurophysiology aware assessments, both in terms of scalable at home approaches and in terms of modeling multimodal signals for better accuracy, the question is what next? So the future of neurophysiology aware assessments includes several interconnected areas of research. There is an opportunity for uh, expanding the range of clinical outcomes that we can product, uh, predict across clinical domains. Uh, for example, we could look at developmental and learning outcomes in children, uh, both from early childhood through adolescence, or look at measuring cognitive decline in older adults at a daily or weekly frequency, which is not currently possible outside clinical settings. Uh, we could also look at novel assessment settings and measures. So we could look at how to leverage uh, simultaneous active and episodic uh, data collection with passive longitudinal data in the daily life to better predict outcomes. Uh, we could also look at embodied assessments with various interaction paradigms with different instrumented objects like um, uh, sensor embedded playing blocks for children, etc. Uh, the other area is personalization, repeatability, and validity of these uh, assessments outside clinical settings. One could look at personalizing assessments uh, in order to alleviate the boredom of doing these um, assessments again and again in daily life, or to alleviate practice effects uh, during repeated assessments using generative AI. Uh, another possibility is to look at evaluation processes and the explainability for emerging technology-based assessments uh, relating them to evaluation processes that are already established for clinical assessments. So um, the fourth area is in the wild biologically informed assessments, where we could look at training cross-modal models with behavioral and neurophysiological data 
and then doing inference with some modalities missing in the wild. This is something that I allude to briefly in our audio only modules for the parent child interaction paradigm that I talked about. Uh, lastly, we could look at stakeholder engagement and the integration of these neurophysiology aware assessments in existing clinical settings. This includes evaluating the utility and usability of neurophysiology data, as well as the assessment outcomes that we predict using our model. Um, and looking into actionable strategies for the practical deployment of these tools, like who's going to pay for it? Is it insurance? Is it the parent, et cetera? Um, so with this, I want to wrap up and thank you again for your attention. And I would be happy to take any questions now or offline. But I also want to spend a moment thanking all our collaborators and the source uh, funding bodies that have funded this work, without whom it wouldn't be possible. Um, so thank you again, and happy to take questions. Thanks a lot, Manasa. It was a wonderful talk. Um, to the audience, uh, please unmute and ask uh, if you have any question to Manasa. Yeah, hi, Manasa. Um, quite interesting, although my background is in computer hardware, so I didn't right. wasn't able to follow a lot of a lot of the acronyms, although I got the general idea. What what's a good reference to you know come up to speed on on this area in terms of the different acronyms you were using? Um, so if you're talking about some of the scales that we use, the clinical scales for um, measuring ground root psychop psychopathology, uh, the way we have come to this is with clinical collaborators. Um, who know this domain much better than us. We are computer wow. scientists. So um, uh, what I know is now a little bit about how clinicians assess children in the three to five year old age range. And I can give you the scales that they use for that population. But this is very different from one population to another and from one mental disorder to another. And as a computer scientist, I cannot speak much to it. I see. So, similar issue. So, um, perhaps on maybe the first time you showed an acronym, maybe if you sp spelled out it, you know, spelled it out once, and sometimes right. you, you know you can kind of reason through what what that was getting at. Um, That's my bad. Uh, totally. So, uh, the CBCL, which is one of the scales we use, it stands yeah. for the Child Behavior Checklist, which is just a checklist for the behaviors that the child exhibits in the last um, seven days. Right. Um, right. Yeah. So the idea here is you would be able to see the child's behavior in the wild, if you will, right? As opposed yes. to when he's or he or she's in an office with a, you know, a counselor or somebody like that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, Manasa, can you hear me? Yes, I can. So this is Hugh. Um, I'm a, a biomedical engineer working on wearables and my wife is a clinical psychologist who does assessments. So okay. I, I get both sides of this. Um, <laughs> and it, it, terrific talk, really interesting. It's amazing which, which, what people are doing in grad school now uh, compared to my day, which was 20 years ago. Um, I had a couple of questions, I think. Um, as as you probably know better than I, so the, the the strength of any machine learning model, any any neural network is comes from from the quality of the training data, right? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes in clinical assessment, the clinicians aren't sure what the diagnosis is, and you have a lot of instances of kids who get diagnosed, say, for anxiety, whereas they have ADHD, right? Yeah. So how do you how do you see overcoming that kind of issue where I think a lot of clinicians might look at tools like this, and, and, and I mean, from from a as a technical person, we see this and we're like, this is great, right? But the clinicians yeah. look at this and say, well, what if this thing tells me that the kid has anxiety, but I just know they have ADHD? Right. Um, great question. Uh, thank you. So um, this was something that actually came up while we were speaking to clinicians. Um, so what clinicians value more than us, the machine learning people, is the raw data itself. So they don't really care about what the machine learning algorithm has 
predicted as an outcome, but they would really value these tools to actually collect data that they cannot collect right now, which is naturalistic in the home data. So they want to see, oh, if the child is reacting to frustration a certain way, that is useful information for them. Uh, rather some than kind saying, of a score, you mean, as opposed to a, a black and white sort of a binary output. Yes, but not even just the score, just the data of like, oh, the child made this expression X times. So if we were able to just predict that, for example, that would be valuable to them. Or um, if there's longitudinal monitoring and we are able to say, oh, this kid had a tantrum um, five out of the last seven days, that is really important to them. So that is something that we're actually trying to address with the parent-child interaction system, where we want to be able to say that, oh, the child exhibited these kind of behaviors, um, and what happened was the parent used this kind of language, which, was, which resulted in the child feeling more stressed, their EDA response went up, their heart rate went up. So these kind of outcomes, if we're able to give clinicians, they would value that more than saying, oh, the child scored above the threshold on the child behavior checklist. So, and then if I could ask a second question, mm -hmm. compared to like a typical assessment that that a clinician does, that you know will take three four hours. Yeah. What do you see as a, as a final form of of an assessment tool like this? Is it something where a child wears it over the course of a week, and then the data gets reduced and and analyzed, or is it still kind of a session based? Uh, where, where you collect the quantitative data over a relatively short period of time? Um, that's a great question. So that uh, brings me back to this uh, episodic versus longitudinal uh, assessment settings. Uh, the best case scenario would be something that would do longitudinal monitoring. For example, the child wears a Fitbit and we get some measures over the course of several days, weeks, or even months. Uh, but uh, at the same time, we also have concomitant uh, episodic data where the child is actively engaged in a task, which is well validated. Um, so we're able to like actually measure something uh, where we account for the context. So um, if, for example, we use these tasks in early screen, we know that when we're collecting these signals, the child was frustrated because they just got negative response. Um, so this kind of a uh, contextualized active assessment along with longitudinal assessment uh, where we don't know the context is probably the best case scenario. Uh, there are other considerations, for example, the child might not want to wear a Fitbit for three months, or they might not want to repeatedly do a task because they're getting too frustrated to do it. Um, so we have to strike a balance between both of these uh, assessment modalities, I think. Thank you. If, if I could share one, one, I, I guess, thought more than a question is, um, I guess I'm a little surprised when you said that the clinicians want a lot of data because what, what I find in working with doctors, and, and this is not research stuff, MDs, yeah. right? This is working doctors, is that they yeah. don't want to be overwhelmed with data. This is sort of a classic issue that they raise, which is, what do I do with all this data, right? Um, yeah. And they all... I think at least I, I work mostly with MDs, not psychologists, but um, mm -hmm. I think it's the same where, where they want. Um, it has to be something right. If, if you take the extreme yeah. example on an MD, as opposed to psychologist, psychologist has an hour, maybe 3 hours to see a child, right? An MD typically right. sees someone in 15 minutes. If you offer them a ton of data, they will say, no, I don't, I don't want it. Actually. Yes. I want you to give me the salient thing that I can digest and. And make make a decision based on within a few minutes, and so I think therapists are a little bit better than that because they 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 don't live in ten minute slots. But still, I would be very surprised if uh, I mean maybe that sort of the, the research active psychologists are interested in a lot of data, but um, I'd be surprised if the working psychologists really want uh, a ton of data coming at them and. You know, hiring someone to actually simply just process that data becomes a, becomes a challenge for many of them. But anyway, th these are sort of challenges that everybody in this field deals with. So it's it's great <laughs> to, to work. I, I I'd assume they they would like a summary that highlights the 
the key things. The, as you mentioned, like the salient yeah. uh, points, uh, rather than a lot of data. But yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. I I think that's why we need more stakeholder engagement. Mm -hmm. Ask them what they want. But uh, I think some of the <laughs> psychologists we talked to did raise this question of like, oh, I don't have enough time. But on the other hand, a lot of folks were like, we just don't get enough data, especially if they're working with um, children of divorcee parents or um, if they're working with children in the foster care system. Um, in these settings, they just don't have access to uh, information from both parents. They rarely have access to school based information, those kind of things. So they kind of want that in an ideal scenario where they want this naturalistic data, which they don't have right now. But I don't know how they would interpret it if they had it. That is something I would be very interested in exploring, like give them a dashboard with all the data and be like, OK, how do you make sense of this? What is actually useful to you? Yeah, thank you. Hi, this is Alan. I had a question which is, have you looked at uh, the difference uh, between sort of what I, I would call type one and type two errors, which are false positives and false negatives, you're sort of reporting overall scores like area under curve and F1 scores. Mm -hmm. But if you change your levels, of course, you could change it so more people uh, get diagnosed with um, you know, neurological, uh, neurophysiological problems, or the other way you could change it so some of them don't. So, so the question is, do you want to bias it one way or another? Do you want to have more people, you know, do you want to get a higher rate of finding the people with the problems at the risk of, well, at the obvious uh, trade-off that you'll identify more people who don't have problems as having problems, um, which leads to other, you know, issues like parents getting uh, you know, alarmed unnecessarily using false, using scarce resources for people who don't need it and so forth. So I don't know if you looked at the trade-offs of doing those things. Um, great question. Thank you. Uh, so for early screen, for example, we actually s reported the ROC curve because we didn't want to report um, accuracy or F1 like we usually do in computer science papers for this very reason because we want to be aware of this trade-off. Uh, and if you see, I don't know how clearly this is visible, but uh, if you see here, we have a small black dot saying selected threshold, and that is the threshold at which we report this con confusion matrix. Um, so the way we selected the threshold is by oh, sort of balancing, uh, by, by balancing these two variables, but, uh, in practice, I think this is something that clinicians can select for their patients. Uh, another consideration that came up when we were speaking to clinicians is that as a screening tool, uh, they would rather overdiagnose than underdiagnose so that at least they have parents go to the clinic and meet a clinician. And then the clinician can be like, okay, there's nothing to worry about. But parents might see that differently. So you're right, there is a trade off, and different people have different opinions on which side to err on. Uh, so I don't think I really have an answer to the question, but um, that's what we found out from talking to people. Okay, thank you. I'm not surprised you don't have an answer. I was just wondering if somebody considered it and thought about yeah. which they should choose. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess uh, that's right. Like th there is a cost associated with having too many false positives, but then doctors probably see it differently than the parents. So <laughs> it's entirely <laughs> the the two group will tr try to yeah. run this thing with two different thresholds. <laughs> uh, any any other question? This is Jason Durham. I have one question or comment um, in the sense that the motivation for this type of research seems to be really more focused towards long term interventions, child therapy trends and being able to augment, you know, really a, 
you know, various cases for the stakeholders, the therapists mm -hmm. and the parents. And so with that, do you see any value or has any discussion um, been considered for other uh, um, biomarkers such as your polygenic risk scores, multiomics, uh, you know, some of the other variables that could come into play in terms of some of the other physiological uh, indicators? Um, that's a great question. Uh, I think the way we approach this problem is by saying that, okay, there is a lot of work on child therapy and there are interventions being developed which use uh, mobile and wearable sensors to develop, uh, to deliver these interventions. But we're not doing a good job of seeing, um, like screening uh, for deciding whether we actually need that intervention or not, and also whether an intervention is actually working or not. So the measurement part is missing. Um, that is how we approach this problem and focused on screening. Um, so I can't really speak to the other areas because that is not something I have looked at at all, but there is a possibility for all of those approaches. You're right. Thank you. Thank you. Manasa, I actually have a question. Mm -hmm. So the, for the behavioral screening, your outcomes are binary levels, right? Like yes, no. Yes. But um, did you look at like measuring the extent of the problem not, instead of just saying yes or no? Because sometimes like that, that that's the probably the other thing that you'd want to know, like at what stage this is or how what's the extent of. Um, so the reason for looking at a binary threshold instead of a range of scores was because that's how it's sort of done in the clinical domain where they say, okay, here's the CBCL and here's the cutoff score. And if a child falls above this threshold, then they might be at risk for psychopathology. So that was the cutoff score threshold that we wanted to predict. Um, it's also much easier to do classification than regression just as a technical problem. And we are also limited by the number of um, people that we could recruit. Um, so these algorithms are trained on less than 100 participants. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we got a more representative sample where there is a good distribution of children across the spectrum of scores, uh, I think that would be uh, the way to go about it, like say where they are exactly and what is the risk level instead of um, binarizing this thing. I see. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, any other last question? I think, yeah, we just crossed the 6.30 p.m. mark. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, if not, yeah. We have a yeah. Question. yeah, please go ahead. Uh, I first want to ask, uh, you just used the uh, embedding in model. Use, uh, so, as I know, as far as I know, using many model, you really need a lot, a lot of data, a, a lot of data. So, how how do you handle this uh, difficulty? Okay. Right. Uh, yes. So, for for this embedding model that we trained for uh, the multitask supervised contrastive learning, we actually the each input is a trial. So we have up to 30 trials per individual and we have about 80 ish participants and our embedding model is also fairly small. It's a lot of 1D CNNs and very few layers. Um, so, and it's in a multitask setting where it's learning to distinguish between two different objectives of clinical and non clinical, mm -hmm. as well as positive and negative contrast of losses. Um, so by keeping the model size small, by using trial level data to increase the sample size, um, and by using two different objectives for uh, training the model. <laughs> Again, uh, but more data would obviously be better, but these are the steps that we took with the size of the data we have. Also, oh, it's a uh, supervised learning in, in the first stage, right? Yes, this is supervised. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay.
We have one more question. If I yeah, is there time? Yeah. So okay. Sure. So, Hi, Master. It was a nice presentation, actually. So I enjoyed it a lot and uh, learned many things. Um, I just to address uh, like, um, uh, like, I mean, in your study, did you uh, perform leave one subject out type of analysis? Because you have 94 subjects, which is a huge right. thing. Um, all of these are K4 cross validation results. It's not leave one subject out. Um, just because uh, we wanted a distribution of like both positive and negative samples in each fold, uh, but we could also do leave one subject out. We did K fold for that reason. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, Thanks for joining the talk and uh, Manasa, thank you again for the wonderful talk. I think yeah, we've all uh, learned something and it was very interesting to to know about this domain and your uh, research direction. So yeah, best of luck for yeah. your future research works. Uh, thank you. And I see uh, Professor Tawhid Rahman and his lab uh, joining. So yeah, thanks a lot uh, uh, for attending uh, this talk. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. everyone. Yeah. Thanks.